Welcome to the exciting and powerful future of IoT. Probably give you slightly and wear the slide, but it's fine because there's not a lot of text on these slides. So I'm Steve, I'm from New Icon, um, I'm the founder and CEO, and we create software and fun things. And I want to paint the picture of the future of IoT. But I need you to bear with me because I'm going to start right in like the very, very far future and then try to bring it back to the now, okay? And you need to stay with me because it might get weird. <laughs> All right. So the exciting and powerful future of IoT. So just before we start, who here likes the internet? Oh, no, okay. Um, and the word before too. <laughs> If you don't, get out. Um, and, and who here thinks they're better at their job because of the internet? And if you're a software developer, I think you need to put like three hands up. <laughs> OK, good. And um, any sci-fi nerds? Good, good. Preferably the ones that shout and scream when the science is wrong. That's what, that's what we're really looking for. Um, so there's one theme that sort of goes through this talk, and that's that all things will be consumed by the internet, okay? All things will be consumed by the internet. What do I really mean by this? Well, oh look, first thing to have. If we were to think, this is where I need you to stay with me. I've checked we're the right audience, but I need you to stay with me now, okay? So let's imagine a future. If all things are going to be consumed by the internet, then surely humanity itself is going to be consumed by the internet and uploaded into the machine. And we're going to be able to travel on beams of light and become a super organism and do whatever super organisms do when they travel the stars, which sounds fantastic. Um, so uh, let's, and stay with me, let's dig into it a little bit more detail. So a neuron in your brain travels, information travels about 100 meters per second. If I was to create a digital version of your brain, then electronics generally is about 270 million meters per second in terms of its information transfer. So let's be conservative and say 100 million. So in 60 seconds of thought, your digital version of your brain could have 600 million meters per second. So, sorry, 600 million seconds worth of thought. So in one minute, you can experience 700 days of thought. That's two years. So in one minute, uh, you could experience two years worth of thought. So talking to your meatbag brethren would be like talking to a tree, is what people say, sure. Of course, we need to scan your, your brain first, okay? And let's just play this out and see where it goes, okay? So I've got my GoGo -Go Gadget brain scanner. A bit on your head, okay? I turn on my GoGo -Go Gadget brain scanner and upload you into the machine. Oh my God, this is amazing. I can travel on beams of light. I can be anywhere instantaneously. The neat thing about light is it's experienced no time. And I can access compute, unlimited compute power. I can join with other super intellects. I can combine super intellects and I can become a super organism and do whatever super organisms do, okay? The only issue is, uh, you'll then tell me, oh, you can dispose of the meat bag because I'm going to print my awesome body version two, or maybe lots of bodies. Of course, the meat bag you, it's going to say, hang on a minute, I'm still here. Uh, you can't, you, don't get rid of me yet. We've actually done a scan to create a copy. Yeah? There's nothing really special about consciousness or about our brains. It's all just information which we can upload into the machine. So, uh, where does that leave us? Well, it won't be, unfortunately, us that upload into the machine. It will be our robot children. And that leads to the point, what, what humanity do we want to imbue into our robot children? Hmm. I don't know, interesting. And it sounds crazy, but if you stay with me, are we not already doing this? Are we not already uploading our information into the machine? Every thought we think into social media, every thought we think into video, we can even create digital twins of ourselves, right? So we have a digital twin of ourselves, so that when we die, the AI, like powered by GPT-3 and things like this, will consume our previous uh, information, and then our grandkids' grandkids can talk to a version of ourselves that might even actually be more smart than us, but represents our current thinking. 
basically complaining about this young children probably uh, back in my day things are things are better uh, so all things will be consumed by the internet maybe even humanity itself so humanity becomes a thing a human becomes an internet thing or a thing on the internet and this brings me to new icon <laughs> Ran about because i originally started new icon about 16 years ago with the premise that all things will be consumed by the internet Okay, of course, back then we were talking about business systems, you know, uh, everyone was on their Microsoft Access and their spreadsheets, it was one player, and you'd have like little mini silos and you'd send people files. And it's like, well, we spend most of our energy convincing businesses, this is going to go into the internet, this is going to go into the cloud. Of course, people don't really challenge that now. And so this new icon. Um, and I've got a few confessions, this is a very long intro, but it's a uh, few confessions to me. Of course, the talk is called The Exciting Future of IoT. And we've gone to the extreme future, which is, of course, complete consumption, where humanity itself becomes the internet and travels the stars and does whatever a superhuman mixed multi organism becomes, this consciousness thing. Of course, the actual exciting thing is the exciting and powerful future about IoT is right now, right? So we can, can the technology is cheap, the technology um, is about connecting physical things, and it's actually happening right now. Uh, confession two, oh, man, it took a long time to convince myself to talk about IoT because I just hate the acronym. For some reason, IoT shuts off the brain. No one says, I'm going to go and create an IoT thing, a thing thing. Um, and also, some person mentioned a fridge when they were talking about, oh yeah, IoT is the future, and you can connect your fridge. And so now any article read, they mention a fridge, and everyone's like, why would, why would I want that? Sounds rubbish. You know? And just, if we explore the fridge just for really quickly so we can move on, right? If you want an IoT fridge, just put a webcam in your fridge. So in the shops, you can look at your phone, see what's in your fridge, and great. You don't have to remember what's in your fridge, okay? But we're going to move on from fridges really quick. I've realized just made the problem worse. But um, if you want to build an IoT fridge, talk to me after the show, you know? <laughs> so, of course, um, the interesting thing about calling things Internet of Things is that um, as soon as you actually create a successful thing on the Internet, um, it suddenly becomes smart. It's a smart thing, right? It's a smart phone, it's a smart watch, it's a smart speaker. So that's kind of interesting. So this is on to, well, what is the Internet of Things? Well, it's really a platform. It's a platform of the physical and connecting the physical. It's about our Everyone's talking about the metaverse, which essentially is connecting more things right, to this connection, this, this internet, right, the network of everything. So, all things will be consumed by the internet, um, including this presentation. So, all the imagery in this is actually generated by Dali. So, we did the title slides and we fed it into the machine and um, we came up with some of these images. Of course, back uh, when we were doing coding, everyone was saying, really, are you sure this business system can be powered by web technology? And we're like, yeah, no, well, totally. I know Internet Explorer's really bad. It's going to get better. And then, of course, recently people were like, design tools, though, they're pretty cool. Like, that's never, that's never going to be on the web, is it? And recently, obviously, Figma has been purchased, and that's big hoo-ha. Because things generally travel to where they can be multiplayer. We, we like, as humanity, being with other people will go where the other people are, where it's easy to do multiplayer things. And then, of course, the interesting thing right now is because the internet and computers on the internet themselves and data centers are becoming internet things, we have these new applications that are born completely from the internet, which are, which are these language models like GPT-3, like uh, DALI, which is not really possible to do on your individual computer. So, Another, I'm just going to go rattle through some IoT stuff, which is kind of interesting. So, the eyes and ears of the internet. This is one way I like to think about it as well. It's like sensor dust. You can sprinkle on something and start collecting information. Uh, you know, the human eye, we only see about a, one, a three hundredth of a percent of visible light. Um, that's like 0.003% of visible light our eyes can see. Uh, I mean, I guess it's good for planet Earth. We can only really see red, green, and blue. And we've only got those receptors. So our retinas are a bunch of receptors, red, green, and blue. What the hell is yellow? Yeah. 
No one knows. <laughs> it's a fabrication of the mind. It's when a little bit of red and a little bit of green fires. Okay, and and the exciting thing about the Internet of Things is we can sprinkle this sensor dust on things, start collecting data that can allow us to expand our own consciousness and, and experience the other areas of reality. Of course, if we're collecting data, we're collecting data to feed the AI monster, right? <laughs> like this picture. He's feeding the AI monster. Um, and of course, that's great for, uh, although this picture doesn't depict it, giving um, creating predictable maintenance and doing things and, and uncovering the value of your data. And there's an internet of behavior which Gartner recently uh, coined. And this is kind of like tracking. At the moment, we track people through their, um, you know, what they do when they go from browser to browser to browser or even on their phones from app to app to app. And the internet of behavior is not just about people, but it's about tracking things through their virtual and their physical world. You know, if we've got these senses, we can track which is great, and this will give us affordances to all kinds of cool stuff, but we need to make sure that obviously privacy and ownership is a real issue, and we need to make sure that we're in the power seat and the driving seat with this, okay? Who do we share our, this is a robot and a human fighting over data, so apparently in a vault in, in, in the privacy. So yeah, and making sure that we're in the driving seat of the eye. <laughs> yeah. So will we create a technology utopia or will we create a technology dystopia? What I love about this, as soon as you say misery, it injects a traffic signs. <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, lots of people say when I talk to them about, I'm a technology optimist, and people say, hey, uh, oh, we're going to be ruled by machines and it's going to be terrible, but um, I don't really think that. They also say, oh, it's not natural. It's like, <clears throat> wear shoes. We're monkeys in shoes that fly in tubes through the sky. Like, there's nothing much about the natural, but of course we can't disconnect how natural we actually are. We're a symbiotic relationship of the natural world. If we trace the ancestor of this pot plant, plant back far enough, we share a common ancestor, which is nuts. <laughs> it's like, hi cousin, distant cousin. And so the interesting thing about IoT, for me, it's really the first time in tech that we can really get back to the natural, understanding the natural world, understanding I know very little about this pot plan, but perhaps we can connect our information and start creating these symbiotic relationships much better together. And we're doing this, we've got some really interesting projects with virtual farming and with actually home growing, where you don't have the time to be your own home farmer, but you know, the, um, our machines can do this, and we can create a much more natural environment. And of course, health tech. In the future, someone's going to come home from hospital, and they're probably going to like die or something. And we're going to say, you know what? If they had this, which is readily available, we would have spotted the issue, we would have fixed it. And therefore, it's going to be a liability, liability issue that people in the future will have to wear these trackers. And it's already happening. The technology is already here, but it's just lagging behind with the legislation. But in the future, it'd be, well, no, you must go home with this device that tracks your health because we've done this operation, we're still liable. And I guess this is talking on the nature. This is about programmable biology. And this is kind of out there. In the future, you can imagine the exchange of DNA information. There's a great book that talks about the next 500 years and about seeding and, and about our responsibility as a species to, um, to be like shepherds and to reduce the misery and understanding DNA and sharing this on the network. There's even a retrovirus that you can do that, that, that will um, uh, create a program that will release information. This can then talk to your smart health devices. And so biology can actually also be plugged into the internet. Um, there's also programs you can do in DNA right now, and they've done crazy things like actually add additional base pairs. But you can write a program that says, you know, if you express this protein, then just like run the destroy cell function. Of course, it's a mess. It's like the worst. It's not too tidy code. Um, and yeah, we. The, the pictures for this one weren't great, so we just run through it real quick. So smart batteries, smart cities, smart supply chains, smart communications, like smart organizing communications um, are going to be really interesting. Of course, smart factories, uh, internet connected factories and collections of those that can automatically manage their supply. Supply chains, like lots of companies don't realize that when there's a port fire over here or when a mine shuts down, they're going to have a lag and they're going to have a delay. They just don't have that knowledge. 
And you can imagine, you know, like an Uber of supply chain where you can see your raw materials all come in. It's like, okay, I can see that they're all gonna, I can see there's a delay here, so I need to maybe buy from another supplier. Um, and that's a really interesting place, but it's connecting data on a real grand global scale, but it's surprising what you can do when you do that. Of course, if we've got smart factories, smart factories themselves will be consumed by the internet, and then we'll have um, the Internet of Robotics, which is just something random that we coined um, earlier, which is where um, you can imagine an e-commerce store page and you buy your shoes and your shoes go to the factory that's run by robots and they'll produce your shoes and then it'll get delivered and you'll have wonderful shoes if you can't print them yourself. So the Internet of Robotics. And uh, this is where I get a bit more excited about like science. What cool science can we do? So, so I'm really excited by science, you know, like just what can we explore? What can we discover? And the interesting thing, I think, sometimes about science, you sort of wander around projects and people say, oh, I'm just going to try to learn the difference between this and this. And, you, and a lot of the time, yeah, well, why? Especially if you're like business minded. But you don't necessarily know what you want to discover. And sometimes it's good just to try and discover things. And what this affords us by connecting all these things, what we're really doing is we're creating a common language that everything can speak. And once we have a common language, we, and this is happening right now, we can create composable architecture. And this is something we help create as well, and we use. So composable architecture is where parts of a problem themselves are becoming internet things. Yeah, it's a bit like your roof is actually, uh, I think, well, it's a really bad example perhaps, but like your roof is made somewhere else and you're subscribing to your roof, right? Um, this is happening kind of now. So it's creating like these Lego bricks that anyone can connect. You don't necessarily have to be a coder to do this. So finally, like the meat of the talk. So what I really want to talk about is that these things are right now, and it's the interesting cultural shifts that, um, and the imagination that we need to actually make these things happen. For example, kids playing in the playground will go, Alexa? Oh. and be surprised that Alexa doesn't, isn't omnipresent and doesn't answer them. Well, that's a cultural thing. Like, we would not do that because we know. But kids today do that and expect to get answered. And so that's, you know, the, the future of personal systems are probably omnipresent. You know? Internet dust. Um, expert universal controls. So this is about taking your digital and your physical world with you. There's, people are expecting to control things. I get pretty upset if I can't control things from my phone. If I sign up to a new system, a new bank, if I can't do it from my phone, I'm going to be really grumpy. Now, I'll still be grumpy when I have to do it from my phone because I don't want to be stuck like this all day. Right? I don't want to use your stupid form. Right? I, want, I want the result. And so this is about like the expectation of universal control. I want to be able to control the thing. I didn't necessarily want to do it right now, but I want that to, to follow with me wherever I go. Uh, I'll tell a story about loins. Don't want to embellish it too much, but I was like, on my bank, I was trying to do a purchase. He said, hey, uh, no problem. We're going to send you a text code. So uh, we just need to update your mobile number in the app. So go to the app. It says, great, go to your, your information. OK, great, upload your mobile. Download this PDF and post it to us. <laughs> So universal control. And a lot of the time as well, our sort of mobile phones are proxies for IoT devices because our, our mobile phones connect to the internet, they have a bunch of sensors. And so uh, we're sort of doing that, and lots of apps are using that. But does, does it need to be confined to your phone? Could it just be a device? This technology is really cheap now. Could you not just sprinkle in and have it work when you're not there and connect to it later? And so probably the most transformative IoT project you might not notice at all. This is a tip, I guess, for designers, which is the rehearse and role play, um, which is really, in order to create these cultural shifts and come up with these new ideas, you really have to go and experiment yourself and create the physical product. So we're in a, part um, a product partnership to other companies realize, which is a product design company in Amalgam, that make models, and make the model of the thing, and test it in the environment. There's a great story. So a personal hero of mine is Jeff Hawkins. He like, created the whole mobile computing revolution before like Nokia, he made the Palm Pilot. And uh, he created a, in his garage, a little wooden, version of the palm before he actually had it. And he carried it around and he walked into his coffee shop in the 80s. And was like, I need to get out my phone and check the calendar. Yeah. Now I'm going to go back to my table, put it in my pocket. 
And that's just, that's brilliant. He was, he was similar. I mean, people probably thought he was mental, but you know, he was similar. He's like, if it doesn't fit in my pocket, um, I'm not gonna wanna use it. The other great thing he does was, he, he did rather, was he'd hang out in the shops after they were sold. So he'd hang out and, and he'd pretend to be a customer. And people would come in and say, what's, what's the deal with this palm stuff? You know, what do you use it for? And then he'd listen to what the customer said. You know, they had no idea that he was the creator of the company that created them. And just observing people in user experience testing, particularly, there's way too much uh, testing that happens when people know they're being observed. No one acts the same when they know they're being observed, which sounds a bit creepy. Basically, you've you got to stalk people, but you want to do it right. And there's the technologists, and not just technologists, right? This is about everyone. If you're creating something on the internet, remember there's no S in IoT. So security doesn't come by default. Uh, there's the creepy story of the doll where they have a Bluetooth device, and anyone can connect to the Bluetooth device within 50 meter radius, and they could get the audio track and also speak to anyone owner of that doll. Um, but you know, you, all you need to say is, hey, I don't want anyone to be able to access this. You know, everyone, don't leave that to the techies. Yeah, the techies are gonna be focused in their one thing. Of course, if you are techie, make sure you have security, but it's about thinking out the problem and, and approaching from, security is not necessarily hard. Most of the time, it's just been forgotten. The same happened in, uh, with the internet in the early days, it was all hypertext transfer protocol. It's literally, it's just a pack, it's just a text file that's sent from computer to computer. Okay, now, if you have a username password on that, and I'm on the same network, I can sniff the air, and I can see those packets of text going, and I can read your password. So, of course, we have HTTPS now as standard, which is just encrypted. I can still see the packet going, but it's encrypted unless it's end-to-end. -end. And then, I, and I think, like, there's a lot of um, things happening with Web3, and it is mostly around this encryption, and it's very exciting. But I don't think it changes this fundamental of you need the cultural shift. You need to, you need to prototype it out and experience it first. Uh, the security is actually, that's a technical problem. It's usually pretty easy once you know it's a problem. And so to conclude the talk, basically what we need to do is learn the language of information. Okay, And this is for techies, for designers, for product owners, or any other job role in the future. All of us are coming up to these digital systems. And this is now, this is now disseminating into our physical lives. And so we need to learn this language of information. This is something I'm really excited about in Micron. We want to make it trivial for people to be able to build platforms that can connect devices and data together. And we also want to teach people this um, universal language of information. Yes. There we go. Oh, that's my last slide. So, for a TED finish, okay, <laughs> the TED talk finishes. Um, so, it's a rally call with let's use our human superpower of com communication to learn the universal language of information so that we can power this new platform, this new IoT platform, this internet of physical things. And so when everything is connected and everything can communicate, everything is programmable. And so what will you create in a programmable world? Thank you.